Oh. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the very first installment of the new monthly Dataversity webinar series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. I'm so excited for you all to be here for this first webinar. This series will be held the first Thursday of every month and today Wendy will introduce the series topic and will be joined by two esteemed panelists, Laura Sebastian Coleman and Melissa Dupwig to discuss is enterprise data literacy possible? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, and we encourage you to share highlights via your favorite social media platform using hashtag Dataversity. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you may click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the speaker for our series, Dr. Wendy Lynch, and our two panelists, Melissa and Laura. Melissa is the Director of Analytics at and Data Governance Enablement at Intuit. Melissa has been in the data and analytics space for almost 20 years and is passionate about building teams and improving ways to working of working through analytics capabilities and governance. Laura is the VP of Data Governance and Quality at Prudential. She has worked in data quality management since 2003 and has implemented data quality metrics and reporting, launched and facilitated data quality working groups, contributed to data consumer training programs and led efforts to establish data standards and to manage metadata in support of data governance goals. She is the author of several books, the most recent being Meeting the Challenges of Data Quality Management. Wendy is the founder of analytictranslator.com and Lynch Consulting. For over 35 years, she has converted complex analytics into business value. At heart, she is a sense maker and translator, a consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies. Her current focuses on the application of big data solutions and human capital management. In 2022, she was awarded the Bill Whitmer Leadership Award for her sustained contributions to the science of corporate health. As a research scientist working in the business world, Dr. Wendy Lynch has learned to straddle commercial and academic goals, translating analytic results into marketing success. I heard her speak first at Enterprise Analytics Online, one of our online conferences, and I'm so excited that she has agreed to join us and help us through this challenge of data literacy. So with that, uh, and just so you, you all know, she has a, a book and an online course on become a, how to become an analytic translator. So Wendy, hello and welcome. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for all of you who are joining us. A special thanks to Melissa and Laura. We will be hearing from them in just a few minutes. I'm going to start by having an orientation to this whole idea. We're so excited to launch this series. This is the first one. And we're talking about data literacy from the standpoint of a whole organization, the whole enterprise, not the spaceship, the entire organization. And our question today is, is enterprise data literacy even possible? It's not a surprise to any of you that um, in the past, 10 years, especially the past three years, data literacy has become a huge topic. Before 2010, that decade, it was 6 million searches on Google. The following dec decade, 117 million searches on Google. And the past three years, 143 million searches on Google about what data literacy really is. It's a hot topic for leadership. It's a hot topic for management. And it won't surprise you that 90% of business leaders report data literacy was going to be critical to their company's success. But what are we talking about when we talk about data literacy? Well, there are lots of definitions out there in articles and books, and most of them start with something like this, the ability to read, write, and communicate with data, or read, write, and argue convincingly with data. That is a great start, a great overview, and it was the first sentence in the Dataversity definition that came out in June, but it starts to get more in-depth. So in this definition, it's read, write, and communicate, but in context, including how you understand the data sources, analytical methods, 
techniques that you use and the ability to apply the data and to explain the results of an, an analysis. So it starts to get more comprehensive than simply that read, write, communicate overview. If you look at one of the references that I know Laura thinks of very highly, Michael Larson says that in order to be data literate, you must be able to do these six things. You must be able to know what data is appropriate if you want to answer a particular question, to be able to read charts and graphs and interpret what you see, to understand that whole path of data from sources all the way to visualization of results, to know which kind of data and how to see data once you've done a particular analysis, how to know what's going wrong, whether it's improperly used or biased or misleading, and then finally to be able to communicate about data with others. So we see that it's starting to be way more comprehensive. It's starting to get more and more definition. And probably the, the most detailed that I've seen is from a group called Data to the People. <clears throat> and this one is used by the nation of Canada to try and advance data literacy nationwide. And this organization has identified 15 databilities data all the way from collection to manipulation, to analysis, to visualization. And each one of these databilities gets rated on uh, six different levels. So we're starting to see a real drill down into what do we need to have people able to do, comfortable doing, if we are going to reach data literacy at the enterprise level. But let's take a moment here and think about this. If I look at this overall definition, can you read, write, and communicate with data? There's now starting to be a real examination of who is comfortable with this. According to Accenture, only 21% of employees nationwide say they're confident that they have those skills to read, write, and communicate with data which means four out of five are not confident. Then if we add all of these other things about understanding sources of data, analytical methods, techniques, how to apply it, I think it would be generous to say, my guess is fewer than half of those 21% start to feel comfortable here. So we're talking about enterprise data literacy, but we're thinking maybe nine out of 10 people in general across all organizations are comfortable with this idea of digesting and being able to make use of data. So what I want you to do is I want you to imagine what it's like for a person who doesn't understand data to be presented complicated data-oriented information. So I invite you to just sit back and listen and imagine what it's like. Lady Dideracy, a corporative imperate. Companies seed data, do's data, drive with theta. Critical that weech erker, build skater dills, drake made a chivin doises, under del most dance, to pre-make good dictions. And in gore accurate, devry A. Going nada makes you more malleable. Band businesses poor profitable. Spet garter, dute, belate its two four. Moinji, learn rutan, majestic lottles and dilled bashboards. Let's try that one more time. Lata diteracy. Corporative imperate. Dumpany seed nada, do's ada, drive with theta. Crits itical that weech erker, build skata dills. Drake made a chivin doises. Under del most dance to pre make good dictions. Edding gore macurate devry a. Doing nada makes you more malleable. Bend isnesses, poor profitable. Smet Garter 
dute, belated to four. Moinji, learn rutan, majestic lottles and dilled bashboards. For people who don't understand data, for people who didn't go to school for economics or data science or computer science or math, data are scary. And so part of this series will be about communication and about the empathy that we all need to have when we are asking people to do something brand new that may not be natural to them and how to make it non-threatening. Imagine that my next announcement is real. At the end of this session, every attendee on this webinar is gonna be asked to turn on their camera and either sing a show tune or do a handstand. If you happen to be able to do handstands and sing show tunes, then you're gonna be asked to sing a show tune while having a handstand. And we're gonna rate your performance and we're gonna send that video to your boss. That's how it feels when you aren't naturally good at something. I know if I had to sing a show tune or do a handstand, I would be very, very, very nervous because I know I couldn't do it well. So we're gonna keep talking in this series, not only about what we need to accomplish, but the format and the culture that goes around accomplishing these things. So to remind ourselves, because most of us in this field, we went into it because we love data and analytics. We love it, we know it, we live it, we breathe it. But a recent survey of 2,000 representative members of the American adult population show that one third of Americans do not know that a quarter of a pie is 25%. 54% of Americans say they just smile and nod rather than admit that they don't understand something. And almost a quarter actually say they can't understand numbers well enough to even read their own bank statements and they need their family to help them. Now, these may not be all the people in your organization, but there's gonna be some organizations where there are a lot of people who have a ways to go. The bad news is about 60% of Americans avoid dealing with numbers, but the good news is that over half of them realize that if they could get better, if we could do this in a way that encourages people and helps them grow, they know it would help them in their lives and in their work. So I'll finish up setting the stage by reviewing the results of a series of focus groups that Dataversity conducted in December. And it included people like yourselves, people who work in the data field and out of six hours, all of the transcripts were um, put together into this world, this word cloud. And so I will use this word cloud to give you a synopsis of six hours of focus groups in about six minutes. So the themes that we heard were number one, yes, data literacy is important. It is something that people need to know and they need it now more than ever. Also, that it's getting absolutely critical that everyone become more data literate. But there was a lot of questions in the focus group. Where does this effort to build literacy belong? Is it part of uh, data governance? Is it system-wide across the organization? Is it part of training and onboarding? Or maybe it's a separate program that's not part of other training? Should it come from management from the top down? Or should it come from the, from the bottom up within teams? Another question was, um, who's supposed to be literate? Is it everyone in the whole company? Or is it by level? Should we be making it required for just the right people? Or do we have the need for everyone to actually be able to do it 
within a team or within a specific job or across different stakeholders. And once we know who, how literate do we need them to be? And this was a very significant topic because on the one hand, we think, well, depending on your role, you might have different levels, um, but it's important that people understand certain aspects of data, especially quality and definitions of the data that they use. We actually want them to be able to ask questions that are intelligent about the data and to be able to talk about the data that they use on a daily basis. But there were some people who said, we need everybody to be actually become an analyst so that everybody can be self-serve and be able to find information that they need without so much help. What is the goal of data literacy? Well, first and foremost, it's creating business value. We want enough change to happen that there will be leveraging all the data assets to make information-driven decisions. And on top of that, we actually want a level of transformation so that we have better and better use of data to advance the needs of the organization, but also advance the skills of our population. And lastly, the groups also talked about the challenges. What gets in the way? And first and foremost, it's the burden of what it's gonna take to spend the time and the money to actually train everybody across an organization. And then when we think about implementation, whew, so is this something that we do certain number of sessions each year and then we're done? Or is this an ongoing thing where everybody needs to have continuous education over time? So this is the setup, this is the landscape that we wanted to uh, provide to you as we go into our discussion. And I am so excited to have Melissa Depweg and Laura Sebastian Coleman here. Both of them are gonna give you examples of companies who are doing this well and who are further along because their companies value data and have already begun to address this issue. We will, I will ask them a set of questions, but we will also take your questions uh, toward the end of the session. So I wanna start with you, uh, Melissa. I, how did your company decide that literacy was an important goal? Thanks, Wendy, and hello, everybody. Um, really looking forward to our discussion today. Um, so at Intuit, we have our, a main strategy to be an AI-driven expert platform. It seamlessly blends digital and human financial experts, and that requires us to build world-class data, models, and AI-driven experiences. This, of course, means that our product managers and our leadership must make data-driven decisions with speed, and that requires data literacy. And for us, our data literacy definition really matches Wendy your second definition. Understanding the context, communicating data um, in that context, having a basic understanding of sources, constructs, data flows, analytical methods, and the techniques applied, and the ability to really describe the use case the application and the resulting value. And so for us, it's it's the cornerstone and foundation for us to. Uh, to do our strategy, right, and achieve our goals. Right. And so is that, it sounds like it's happening at all levels of the organization. Is that is that correct? Or, or where, where would you say that sort of started? I would say that the, the need for data literacy really crosses all roles, mm -hmm. um, specifically, and I'm seeing it even in the chat, um, trying to focus on specific personas. Yep. Uh, the personas we're really focusing on are, are the product managers and leadership. Of course, we have a huge um, population of data workers, which includes data engineers, data scientists, analysts, um, and they're, they're all trained and do this every day. Um, and so in order to make them the most effective, all of their partners or stakeholders really need to be data literate. 
Yeah. And, um, and that really is like what's driving uh, our focus there. Got it. Got it. So Laura, um, same question to you. Uh, how did Prudential decide that this is an area that is critical to your business? And Laura, I think you're on mute if you want to unmute there. There you go. I am computer literacy too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So Prudential has not directly uh, launched a data literacy initiative, um, but I I can speak to the the importance of data literacy nevertheless because of the type of company that it is um, and the type of, and I'll also comment on on, uh, other companies where I've worked and why, why this is important. So Prudential sells insurance and financial products. Those products are dependent on understanding uh, the current, uh, understanding how to underwrite an account, understanding the risks associated with um, with uh, any kind of condition that you would want to insure. And then from a financial products point of view, understanding market conditions and likely outcomes from investments and the like. All of that really is about data, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Those products are completely data dependent. So it's it's critically important that the, the folks that are creating those products understand that the data that they're working with and can interpret that that data and uh, use it to build the products and to sell those products and uh, to make them valuable to our customers and to also to you know make money from that process. So everything in the in the industry is mm-hmm. dependent on data, right? And that means that the people that are using the data definitely need to understand understand what it means how to use it and and the like if you don't have a a level of knowledge about the data itself you you can't make good decisions about it right so right so so you're um you're the way it sounds is that you're believing that this level of data knowledge and data literacy extends way beyond the folks who are building the product and manipulating the data all the way you're talking about sales and um, interpreting for clients. Yes. And, and I think one of the things that's interesting when we talk about data literacy, right, is sometimes it gets presented as if it is a, a new thing, but in many businesses, understanding your data is really understanding your business. So yeah. think about, uh, I'll give a, a, a simple example of uh, if of banking, right? I know banking is complex, but um, I used to work in a bank on the teller line. And for us to be successful as tellers, we had to balance our cash accounts. And that meant that we were creating data throughout the day that indicated how much cash we had. And at the end of the day, we had to reconcile that. If anybody was doing that relatively simple job and didn't understand the relationship between the data they collected and the outcomes at the end of the day, then they wouldn't really be able to do that job very well. And that, again, that's a simple job, but when we think about um, the multitude of processes that people have to engage in, if you understand what you're responsible for and the data you create or use, then the the organization itself is going to run better than if people are not aware of that. And, and so I, when I think about this problem, I think about it really as educating people first in the data that they actually interact with and, and knowing their own jobs and their own processes and inputs and outputs. And then, um, and then you, you do need people with higher levels of understanding of the operations of the entire business, but it, the first step is kind of realizing, wow, our enterprise, whatever that enterprise is, is 
uh, bound together by data. And so each person who has responsibility towards data at the very least needs to understand how their data works. And the more they understand about the wider, the wider organization, the, I think the better off that organization will be. So definitely yeah. there are different levels and, and such, but it starts, it starts with each person's work. Right. Right. It starts with where they are. I, I heard somebody call data the actual bloodstream of a living organization. And I thought that was a wonderful way to talk about it because if it doesn't flow and you don't use it right correctly or you you stop the data or don't do the things you need to, then you actually harm the whole organization. So yeah. 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 Or if, if it's of poor quality, <laughs> um, you know, it, that, that brings harm as well. And especially if people can't recognize it, right. Which brings right. the literacy question in, like, how do you, how do you not only, not only are you able to use the data, but you know, how yeah. do you know when something might go wrong or, or the like. Right. So, so Melissa, uh, either from this particular role that you're in now or from the past, we just heard from Laura an example of how literacy or low literacy might show itself in just balancing what's in the cash drawer. Um, but what other ways would our listeners here notice lower data literacy in an organization? Well, I think there's two ways to think about data literacy. It's either currently blocking you from you know, performing and, and achieving your current goals, or it's required in order for your, your company to grow and, um, and achieve future, future goals, you know, three, five years, 10 years out. Right. Um, and so at Intuit, it wasn't so much um, us noticing the lack of literacy, but the continuous need to increase the amount of people who can self-serve data and insights so that our analysts and other data workers can focus on more advanced analytics, such as building complex statistical and AI models. Um, you know, we're, we're at the leading edge in the industry for personalized recommendations and predictions serving our millions of customers. Yeah. But that means that most of our descriptive intelligence activities, like what happened last week? Why did that happen? What were the key factors that drove that KPI down? need to shift to, you know, product managers, leaders, um, and, and other um, business type analysts who aren't always in the data. Um, and also it becomes important, especially for product managers to have a good understanding of what's even feasible yeah. so that we can continue to grow and improve and push the boundaries of our experiences. Um, and so, you know, I, I, think, I think what was really interesting that you, uh, showed in your presentation was that continuum um, and maturity of data literacy in the key areas. Yep. And I think that continuum is very much linked to the company's maturity for their data and analytics um, yep. areas, right? right? In the early days, if maybe only a handful of analysts exist in the company, even if their skills are really high, they're supporting everyone else in the company to explain their work, what it means, how they got there, you know, why it should be believed over someone's intuition. Right. Um, and that limits their impact, right? Right. But as companies evolve and they start requiring data to make those types of decisions, you need to add more people even on that continuum and then continue to grow their maturity to open up analysts and data scientists to do much more complex things um, right. to, to really increase what the company can do. Right. And so you really are of the mind that we, we don't just have people learn a little bit for the most part, and then leave the analyst to do the big work. You would like to see everyone maturing, as you use that word, toward better competencies all across the company. Because if you depend on the few analysts to do all of, answer all the questions, even the simple ones, then they can't be doing the complex work. Yep, exactly. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm also kind of seeing some of the um, the things in chat. I think it's it's critical 
not just for our ability to move at speed to have people data literate and able to self serve things like you know what their key KPIs are and, and even get into the curiosity of why the KPIs are doing what they are. In my mind, it also um, pushes the ownership right to to people like product managers um, and really get them to own their own KPIs instead of oh the KPI dropped. Um, you know, analysts tell me why that is. Right. Um, they they get even more invested because they can be curious on their own and, and drive their own answers. Right. Um, and, you know, something that Laura had mentioned as well, the, the trustworthiness of your data yep. is so ingrained with this, because if you don't have trustworthy data, I think a lot of people who are maybe not as data literate or don't understand the complexities of the data, they see a KPI go down and their immediate question is, oh, well, what data issue is, is it? Like yeah. what's wrong with the data, right? <laughs> what, what what broke? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And it it kind of takes away that the ownership of like, hey, well, let's actually find out why. Maybe there's you know business uh, factor or variable that's driving it. Right. Right. Well, it is. It, it's it's much easier to blame somebody else than it is to uh, start to take responsibility. And what you're saying is, if they own their keep KPIs and they have to sign off that the way it's being collected and managed is accurate. Then, 100%. then they would have to now answer the question themselves of why it's going down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, so Laura, uh, you also, besides the example you already gave, how else would does low data literacy manifest itself in ways that that uh, make the business put either put the business at risk or make things not as effective as they could be? Yeah, so so many organizations today claim to be or are trying to be what what they call data driven, right? So they, you know, they claim they want to take advantage of their data and to get value from their data. Yeah. Um and the we get value from data only when we are actually using data. Everything else costs money, right? To store the data, to make it accessible and such. So if you don't have people who can use the data, then there's a, a direct cost on the business because you're you're preparing data for use, but not being able to take care, to actually take advantage of that. Yep. Sometimes it it shows up in um in in complicated ways, but more often I think the 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 problem of a lack of literacy, lack of data literacy or low data literacy often shows up when people simply don't, uh, the, they don't have the skills to understand what they're looking at when they're, when they're looking at data. Yeah. And I, I loved your, um, I loved your introduction with the, with the translation of um, our assertions about data into this pseudo language, right? Because I, I think you really did effectively remind people of what it's like to be looking at something that you don't understand. Yeah. And and there and yet most of us I think in watching that at least I was, you know, puzzling out, oh, how did you put this together? You know, like did you how did you generate the scrambling of those words so that they still uh they still sounded like language, right? So my curiosity was piqued with with the example that you gave. I think a lot of people who don't have data skills look at that and they really are stymied. And that's not good for the business because as I said, you know, data binds most organizations together. And so you have to be able to talk to each other um, across uh, across business units, within teams and stuff. You you need to represent the work that you've done and you need to understand it. Yeah. Um, even, even things that I think are relatively straightforward because I learned them when I first started working with data, like you know how to construct a, a meaningful uh, time graph, right? right? Or how to organize data even in, a, in an instrument like an Excel um, spreadsheet. A lot of people don't have that uh, knowledge in their heads. And so you present them with, with information that is 
that it, you, you hope the structure itself will help them understand and they don't necessarily see that. Right. So I feel like at those really low levels of literacy, it's a, it's a short, it, sh it should be a short learning curve to, to get up, up to the next level. It should be. But the things that you identified, people are intimidated by data. It is scary. It is, um, they do feel like it's a different language or something that they can't understand. And, and what that means is if they're not, if they're not able to understand or not willing to try to learn, it means they don't really understand aspects of the business that they need to understand, right? Yeah. Um, like how people in, you know, how parts of the organization depend on each other and interact and the like. And that is very, you know, very bad for an organization. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, when and, and I'll step back for a, a moment. When when I think about data literacy, I almost always compare it to general literacy, right? So we all have a stake in having an educated populace who can at least uh, read and communicate with each other through written language and understand written language because we need so much of our lives depend on that ability right yeah. if, and and if we don't have that in relation to data in most organizations we're really really doing ourselves a, a disservice yeah. um, and at the same time, we can build that because it is a question of helping people understand better and giving them opportunities to learn and also, you know, delivering with that message the importance of those kinds of uh, learning opportunities so they can get better at, at their jobs and at contributing to the organizations that they are part of. Right. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you that at how important it is for organizations to have as many people as possible understand. I, I do know that when I get hired as an analytic translator, often it's a leader who is not data oriented, who is not uh, getting what he or she needs from the analytic team, not because the analytic team isn't talented or doesn't have the resources that they need, but because they do not know how to talk to each other. The data yeah. people don't know how to explain it in English, and the non-data people don't know how to ask uh, good questions of data, which is where I come in. And one of my main goals is to demystify each side and have them appreciate each other and build a mutual respect. And that way you get have an environment where people are willing to learn. Because yeah. if you're feeling like you're being belittled every time that someone lectures you about their, you know, logistic model, um, then you tune out and you think they're just trying to be jerks about it. So there, there are communication issues on both sides, I think, that have to go along with it um, to get us there. Um, yeah, and I, I love the word that you used, demystify. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I do think that sometimes we talk about data as if it's some kind of magical thing and and people who are are very knowledgeable about data, you know, can get off on uh, tangents or, in, you know, use vocabulary that gets in the way of that communication. Yeah. And yet when it comes down to it, you know, data is representing it. It's a representation of the aspects of the real world. Yes. So it's so, and that's so fundamental to it. If we can get people back to that, like common sense, you know, this is to go back to my teller example, this is the number of transactions you did in your eight hour stint. And, you know, this is the amount of cash you should now have in your drawer. That's what those all represent. Yeah. If that simple concept, you know, not everything breaks down as simply, but many things do when you break them down are uh, are much simpler than yeah. than they get presented as. And we just need to kind of, um, as you said, demystify it. Let's let's learn from it, not treat it like it's magic. Right. I like to say that um, my favorite word is sesquipedalian, which means the desire to use very big words that you don't need to use 
So I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, own, it's, it's its own definition. Um, yeah. So um, we have to avoid uh, as data people being sesquipedalian. So, so Melissa, as you listen to what Laura had to say about, especially how do we find this middle ground? Is there a particular way that you've seen um, introducing the idea of, of data literacy in a way that's non-threatening? I think for us, um, we're actually more focusing on the skills that would make someone data literate versus mm -hmm. calling it data literacy. Um, because I think, you know, to earlier points, both, you know, spoken by the two of you as well as in chat, um, telling someone like they need to increase their data literacy can be um, a little bit jarring, right? Yeah. So um, we, you know, we've done a, a few surveys, right? Um, right? Sending out to our employees, just especially for our non-data workers. Hey, what's your interest in, in all the different aspects of data, whether it's data storytelling, visualization, pulling data, leveraging SQL, building models, et cetera. Where's your interest in learning? Um, and surprisingly, unsurprisingly, um, 80% of our respondents uh, wanted to learn data storytelling. They see the value in it. Um, they, they want their messages to um, their stakeholders, to their leaders land. And, um, you know, we were a, a data-driven um, uh, company, right? And so that, that is the expectation. So um, there definitely is a healthy, a healthy pull, if you will, from, um, from our non-data workers to continue to increase their skills. And so maybe I'm like a little bit lucky in, in that aspect that there is just so much interest already. Right. But yeah, I would say our approach really is um, to focus on the skills and not necessarily, you know, saying that this is our data literacy program. Yeah. And can you say a little more about when you fo say focusing on the skills, is it just that you've started to get people's interest um, in those surveys? Or is there a mechanism that you actually already um, have to start to implement that level of learning? Yeah, we've had a variety of grassroots campaigns to increase data literacy and, and train different parts of the company. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been very successful in terms of the interest. Now we're looking to formalize it much more broadly so that we can drive consistency in, in what that education is while also being a little bit more efficient in how we're um, creating and, and pushing out the training. Yeah. Um, so we're going to focus on a combination of computer-based um, data literacy courses and then also some live hands-on workshops. Um, I'm a big proponent of like hub and spoke models or, or even like train the trainer yeah. um, type models. I think um, there's a lot of companies probably um, out there where they have a very small team focused on data governance or, or training and, and being able to, um, to provide that service. And so as that company grows, expecting that one small team to be able to handle everybody um, becomes just unscalable. And so finding like those those um, subject matter experts within each of the different areas that can then be responsible for um, increasing uh, the literacy for that area becomes a more scalable option, uh, which is um, the approach that we're taking. Yeah, and so um, you're saying though that uh, you're not necessarily calling it data literacy. You're, is it just that you're calling it skills? Like what are the skills you would like and do you wanna learn new skills? Is that? Yeah, and it, it for us, it's also, um, we, we have an approach called Follow Me Homes where we really sit and observe um, how people are doing their work and almost organically seeing any sort of challenges they may be coming across with data. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so that's more around how the survey is, is represented. Like, hey, what are some of the challenges you're facing when, when dealing with data or um, trying to um, move at speed? And some of the answers can be, well, my analysts don't have enough time to give me the answers I need. Or, um, which then is followed up with, I'd love to be able to do this myself. Um, and, and so when you're getting those types of verbatims over and over, it really just um, creates like that grassroots campaigns that we've seen. Got it. And so I, I did see a question in the chat, like how do you, 
How, and I'll ask, I'll start with Laura and then come back to you, Melissa. So how do you convince people that it is important to them individually? How, how, how do you um, help people get on board of, you know, if it is the lifeblood of the organization, what steps have you taken or have you seen in other places that that help people go, gosh, yeah, I, I really do need to learn this. And, and it would be really great to do that. Yeah, so I've, I've led data quality management teams in, in several different organizations. And, and within uh, those teams, people often come to the work with different levels of knowledge about data. And so I've, I have used my own experience to try to try to help team members uh, understand the kinds of things that they need to know about data. So when I started in data quality management, I had not worked directly with data at all. I, I had, or at least I wasn't, you know, a data analyst in using um, information technology to solve problems or anything like that. I'd had the kind of day-to-day -day experiences with data that I described earlier. And what I've found works best when you're trying to get people to understand data and especially how it relates to their, their own job is to give ex examples, try to show them what, what they can see in the data. Um, now, when you're dealing with you know data quality analysts, they're looking at two kinds of data, both their, the data that they are trying to understand problems in and uh, the data that they generate through data quality management processes that they have to interpret. And they need to need to know both of those. Yeah. And I've had, I, I've personally had, the, the moments that I've found most useful are when people have shown me how they analyze data and what they're able to see because they have the the skills to to do that kind of analysis and so that those are the kinds of things that i i try to share with my teams and i've seen this at a, a larger level you know at a at a um at an organizational level for example during the pandemic right i was working for a healthcare company during the pandemic and so we had first of all, a lot of uh, effects on the organization because of the pandemic. And our, our data and analytics team did a lot of work for the chief medical officer so that he could communicate to the organization as a whole how he understood the situation um, as it was evolving. And his examples and the work that the analytics team did to me were just really very powerful because they were able they they as a team communicated to the rest of the organization how they saw possible progression of the pandemic and what it meant to our business both in terms of you know how healthcare would be provided and how we would get basic functions done like claim adjudication and the like so that was like a huge example yeah. where I think everyone in the organization, simply by paying attention, um, could understand the power of reliable data and also could understand the limits of data. You know, there are so many things we did not know about at that point. Right. So right. I, I feel like every opportunity that we have to show how you can, uh, how you can use data to understand the world and and you know to show that it really is it's not about the technology it's not about um some something showy and glitzy but it, it really is like what questions do we want to answer and um how do we use the data to answer those questions when people see examples i i think that's where they both learn about data and get excited about what can be done with data Got and it. if you have that message that you know the connected message that hey this is something you can learn to do then that makes it um that makes it seem accessible in a way that sometimes it doesn't 
when people are just throwing statistics at you. Right, right. So making these examples real and tangible so that people are recognizing that this is a, a, an outcome related to data. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, as I was listening to Melissa, I, I wrote down a note of just as the, the benefits of, of being part of a data literate culture come when you have the conversations between people and when your leadership can understand the business better and communicate that out to employees and other stakeholders. So it's like the, the more we are able to help each other understand data, the better able we are to be an organization that's data literate, not just individuals who know how to use data. So I feel like some of the points you made at the beginning, Wendy, about, you know, what's the cultural context? How how empathetic are we, right? right? If we find if we're talking to someone who clearly doesn't understand what we're talking about, is our reaction to be, you know, angry that they don't get it, or is our reaction to step back and figure out how we can help them? I right. think that, you know, that's part of the the elevating part of of uh the enter of, of the this, of this series process. yes yes yeah agree Cause, yeah because it's agree. really about helping people <laughs> it is it is yeah so that leads to a question that i see um because you're giving examples of how you're taking tangible results that are specific to a person's job or an a company's experience like the pandemic and applying that in a way that you get um you get people's attention, you get people's buy-in and, and you have them maybe get inspired to learn. So Melissa, this there's a question here that's, um, uh, is there a universal set of skills and definitions that everybody should be learning that can be sort of off the shelf purchased or is it better to sort of do an in-house homegrown approach to this because the data sets are so unique. Do you, do you have a, an, a sense of that or an opinion about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think in my opinion, there's so much awesome training out there um, yeah. for basic, you know, how to understand data, um, how to read a chart, um, how to almost like develop that curiosity when you see numbers um, to, to dive like that, that extra layer lower. Um, and I know all of us are feeling, you know, the, the cost constraints, resource constraints, we, we always have that. And so being able to leverage outside training as much as possible um, is definitely a way uh, that, that we're gonna go. We, um, we, within our company, we have access to those types of trainings. And so for us, it's really um, creating pathways for people so that they're not having to hunt around and figure out which training they should take. We're providing strong recommendations of, hey, if you want to learn the skill, take this particular training. Um, and, and we can almost put it in like the series so that we're, we're slowly building their skills up. Um, versus, you know, somebody kind of just throwing a dart and hoping they they hit the board. Yeah. Um, I think there there will be there will be a need to develop more in house trainings for maybe more specific um, specific tools. So, you know, we have um, some in house tools around you know data discovery, um, what what tables are available. And so, of course, we'll have to create trainings just so that people can understand their, the tools and, and leverage them effectively. Right. Um, but I do think it's a balance of both. And so yeah. are you saying that you, um, because uh, you were talking about some train the trainer, is is there an internal training platform and this is part of a much bigger, broader set of trainings that everybody's aware of, or is this separate? No, no, it's it's part of it. Um, you know, I think we all we all have mandatory training that we have to take from from a compliance perspective. Um, and of course, those are available within the platform. Got but there's there's actually a lot of more external trainings available um, that we can easily link to. Uh, and so we're 
we're fairly lucky that we have access to, you know, thousands of trainings, to be honest, across not just data, but, um, but other software and stuff as, as well. Got it. Got it. And so Laura, your opinion or experience about that same question, is it better to be homegrown, better to link into um, resources that are out there that um, are available? Um, what's the... What yeah, do you I, do I definitely, definitely agree with Melissa that it's a combination. Um, I it, it is never an either or. It's never an either or. There, I, I, the way that I like to talk about this is there are certain things that people should learn about what I call data as data. You know, any any data that you're that you might need to look at will have certain characteristics just because it is data and you should understand things like, you know, how data is created, how it moves through your organization or any any organization and how it's stored and accessed and, and used. So that everybody should have a conceptual idea of what those steps are and the like. Mm -hmm. But then of course, you're gonna have to work with real data and there will be characteristics very specific to the data in your organization and in, in your industry and then in your organization. So I don't think we should think of it as either or. We should think of it as how, how do we learn foundational concepts and then how do we um, apply those within our organization or how do we learn about our organization through the lens of those foundational concepts. So, you know, to me, learning about data is, is similar to learning about any other subject. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have to bring multiple, multiple questions to the table and you, you have to understand the, the big structures and, and how to uh, put details in context and the like. So definitely a both and. Okay, so it's 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 homegrown versions uh, after you have made accessible some other good resources that are that are out there. Yeah, either either direction too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I started learning about data because I was right there in a pond of it, and then I, in order for me to understand it better, I had to step back and ask myself about the bigger structures, but it started from the, you know, from being um, suddenly dealing with big sets of data every day. And the, so it can go in either direction. Yes, it can. So I think with a couple minutes left, I'm just going to um, have the, each of you comment. Um, as you think about people who are just starting down this journey in their organizations, Perhaps they don't have buy-in yet. Perhaps they don't have resources allocated yet, uh, but they know that this would be really beneficial. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to think about if there were a couple things that might be a great place for them to start, whether that's a conversation with certain people in the organization, or it's an assessment of where they are, or any other idea that you might have. So um, uh, I'll start with you, Laura, just briefly. If they could take one or two steps, what might they be? Yeah, so I'm a great believer in assessing current state in yep. order to, in order to uh, you know, get to the future state that you wanna get to. So okay. I think really understanding something about both the culture of your organization, how, how it works with data and the kinds of challenges that you're currently having and then envisioning how liter how improving people's knowledge of data will help that i i would take those steps and i love the reference that melissa made to the survey that she asked you know talk to people ask them what what they need or what yeah. you know what can help them and kind of pull that together got it and so, Melissa, you can have the last word. If you could suggest a step or two. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think the first thing I would focus on is like, what's in it for 
them, right? How is this going to really change the trajectory of, um, of, of what we're doing? Um, and finding advocates at all levels within the business, yeah. I think it really needs to be kind of tackled tops down and bottoms up. Um, but last and certainly not least, start small. Um, you can't boil the ocean. You're not going to, you know, make your entire company data literate overnight. Um, yeah. So really start small, find those key areas where you can show significant impact with even just the smallest, you know, smallest of work. Um, and that will build the momentum that you need. Right. So start small is uh, Melissa's first step to see how you could actually make a change. And Laura uh, appropriately saying, let's assess where people are. So um, I have put here uh, the resources that uh, actually Laura provided that she recommends if you need more information about that. And I'll make sure Shannon has that so that we can uh, distribute it to anybody who would like it. And I just want to thank uh, both of you very much. I'm sure it's been helpful for all our listeners to hear uh, those two people who are in the trenches working hard at these things. So um, thank you again, Melissa. Thank you again, Laura. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Um, yeah. yeah, and thank you to everybody on the call and all the comments and chat. Um, uh, I, I've learned a lot myself, so I, I always <laughs> appreciate those opportunities. Yes, yes. thank you yeah, to everybody who chimed in. It's uh, I wish we could get to all of the different questions. Thank you so much for kicking us off. And Laura and Melissa, thanks for joining us to help kick off this webinar series. Again, it's going to be the first Thursday of every month. So excited. And just as a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. I know we didn't have time to get to so many questions that you all had, which were so great, but I will get those over to Wendy and we'll um, collect those and analyze those and really kind of start building out the rest of the series based on the questions that you all have. So really look forward to that. Keep that feedback coming. So thanks everybody. Hope you all have a great day again. Wendy, Laura, and Melissa, thanks so much for kicking us off uh, with such a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.